everybody would bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, Father, God, we thank you for this week. Thank you for a week of growth, a week of maturity in our hearts. Lord, I just pray that you open them up. In Jesus' name, open them up to receive the word through my mouth. Use me as your mouthpiece, Lord, an instrument to your beautiful symphony. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, guys, the message I have for you today is one of great revelation, (laughs) one of the most liberating revelations known to man about the scriptures. A revelation not of my own, of course, but from none other than the Apostle Paul himself. (laughs) As I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 3 the other day, uh, well, a couple weeks ago preparing for my sermon uh, the last time I spoke, uh, something really jumped out on the pages to me, and I kind of shared a little bit about that last week. Um, And I kind of want to expand on that. Uh, I mentioned how we all should take the time and read this chapter to understand the New Testament and being ministers of the new covenant and what that even means. Uh, so I know that can kind of get confusing with there being an old covenant, Old Testament versus the new covenant, the New Testament, what we call it. Um, but if you didn't do your homework and read it on your own, don't worry. We're going to read it together. It's not very long, um, but don't worry. You don't have to listen to my annoying voice. We're going to have a couple of volunteers that have agreed to uh, thankfully read it for us. So without further ado... Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Do you want the uh, PowerPoint? Okay. So Ellie's going to start us off, and then uh, on verse 10, Carla's going to complete it. Here you go. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you. You yourselves are, are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tab- tablets of human heart. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Who has made us sufficient to be ministers of our new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit? For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came from such glory that the Israelites came could not gaze of Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Thank you. Let's give Ellie a hand. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord there is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I've all been told Carla to read that. (laughs) Well, the theme I want to...
focus on this morning is verse 14 specifically, but I wanted to kind of set the scene, set the stage for today. Um, one of my favorite chapters, <clears throat> the veil, picture a bride's veil, you know, what does it do? It conceals, it hides a little bit. Uh, it doesn't make clear the bride's face at a wedding. You can't see her face clearly. The groom can't see her face clearly until the veil is lifted or removed, right? So that's what the comparison is here. The veil remains over our hearts as well as it did the Jews' hearts when they were reading the Old Covenant because they weren't reading it in light of what Christ did. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? I know that's a mouthful, but <laughs> um, the Israelites were, uh, or the Jews were kind of ignorant in a way um, to what the meaning of the scriptures in the Old Testament were <clears throat> or the purpose of them. And he says, even to this day, in his day, did that veil remain because they didn't believe in Christ as the Messiah. So he's basically saying they will continue to walk in that ignorance to the old covenant and what it truly means because they don't read it in light of Christ. Same goes for us, church. If we, do, if we just start in Genesis, I know a lot of people who like first begin their walk with Christ, They'll start in Genesis, which, I mean, it's better than nothing, but, like, you, you start in Genesis because that, that's what makes sense, right? You start in Genesis, and you, you end in Malachi, you know, and it's like, what in the world? But then you finally understand it once you read the, the New Covenant, right, the New Testament. So I always recommend starting in Matthew, end in Revelation, then go back to the Old Testament. It all makes a lot more sense that way. <laughs> I did it the other way, and it <laughs> so I know firsthand. Allow me to illustrate this point with an analogy that helped me understand the relationship between Old and New Covenants, Old and New Testaments. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a movie or read a book from cover to cover, not the Bible, but, um, and you walk away from it like, why did that happen? You just walk away from the movie theater confused, like, what in the world? Or you, you read that book and it doesn't quite make sense, like all the pieces aren't really there. Um, the first part of that movie is just like, what in the world? What, what, did, what was the purpose of this character? Why did he say it like this or like that? You know, uh, what was the purpose of this battle and this? What? I'm so confused, you know. Um, why are we sacrificing animals for sins? Like, it doesn't make sense, you know. <clears throat> but then, a few years down the road, say, I don't know, maybe 440 years later, part two comes out to the movie, right? <laughs> part two of the book comes out. The movie sequel comes out. Usually, usually in the movies, you know, the second part is worse, you know, it's like, I don't really care for the ending, you know, more the second part of the book or whatever. But in this case, in the Bible, the New Testament, it's like, you start to understand the full picture, right? <clears throat> when we read it in light of what Christ did, it all starts making more sense, amen? You see, Christ illuminates, brings to light the Old Testament. So we must read it in light of what he did, Amen. his light, his life, ministry, and accomplishment before we truly understand what the Old Testament is even saying. Christ unveils the story to paint the rest of the picture for us, fills in all the holes. Amen. And we probably haven't even scratched the surface on a lot of what he actually, you know, um, illuminated in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Psalm 72, verse 1. We're going to start to look at some of these um, things that Christ kind of fulfilled. <laughs> Psalm 72, 1. We'll read the first four verses. It says, King David, he says, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the what? The oppressor. Now, King David was writing this way before Christ. But he was writing this actually about most likely to his son Solomon. But Christ can fit just perfectly like a glove Amen. in these verses, right? Because what did he do? He, he judged the righteousness and ju with, ju with 
righteousness, and justice. He defended the causes of the poor. And what did he do? He crushed the oppressor. The oppressor was who? The religious elite, the Roman Empire. We see that, and we can clearly see that now here in 2023. But imagine reading this without knowing that and what Christ did. We'd only be focused on what he was, what David was saying about Solomon and be like, okay, cool, cool story, you know, like, that's cool. But now that we see it, like, it's actually foreshadowing what Christ was doing, amen? Another example, a little more blunt example, is um, of, of Christ being revealed in the Old Testament scripture. It's found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is full of them. But we'll start in uh, chapter 52, verse 13. Isaiah 52, 13. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. All right. Verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance for his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. You can keep going uh, to the chapter 53. Read uh, nine verses here. Awake, awake, put your strength. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall be... No more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. uh, Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Is this uh, chapter 53? Uh, Sorry. Can we get 53, verse 1 through 9? That wasn't really sounding right. (laughs) Sorry, that's probably a typo on my end. (laughs) I apologize. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 9. Thanks. It says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, amen? He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth." Who does this sound like? Jesus Christ, right? Sounds like the crucifixion story, right? right? How many of you know this was written 700 years before Christ even was born? Give or take. Can you imagine reading this scripture or hearing it preached in the synagogues without knowing what Christ would do or what their Messiah was expected to do? You know, this is a prophecy from, from Isaiah, but they... Some of them might have been like, what in the world? This guy is crazy. Like, this don't sound like my Messiah. Those Jews weren't expecting their Messiah to come down and humble himself and die on the cross like that. Like, 
they were expecting their own Julius Caesar for crying out loud. They were expecting, you know, their Messiah to come down, sword in hand, killing everybody, you know, defeating their enemies, putting them under the... And what did Christ do? He humbled himself. Forgive your enemies. Love your enemies. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound right to them. So it just, that veil was over their minds. Amen? It's like the first part of the movie I was talking about. You walk from the theater just so confused. You're like, there's got to be more to this story. Who is this that, G- that Isaiah is referring to? Christ. Lucky for us, we live thousands of years later, and we can look, on the, look at this story, this prophecy in hindsight. Now when we read Psalm 72, Isaiah's crucifixion prophecy, we understand what they were prophetically speaking. Amen. We don't have to live blindly to it. Can you imagine reading these passages without knowing what Christ did at Calvary and what his ministry consisted of? Grandpa illustrated this point wonderfully last week. He explained how the cross was what a lot of uh, the stuff in the Old Testament was really talking about. It was just hidden under the veil. The things in the Old Testament were in the shadow of the cross itself. Amen. It wasn't the fullness of the word of God. It was a piece of it, a little piece of it. Jesus said he came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to what? Fulfill them, right? And he did just that on the cross. He fulfilled them. He fulfilled the need to obey hundreds of rules and regulations. He said it was all summed up in one word. What was that word? Love. Love. Now the Ten Commandments, like Larry said, become prophecy. Instead of commandments, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not steal. It's because you love, because that's written on your heart, you will not kill. You will not steal. You will honor the Sabbath because you love the Father. Amen? So Christ unveils and illuminates the Old Testament to clear many things up. If you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 16. We'll read 16 through 21. Now Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61. Keep that in mind. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. Pay attention to this. This is very important. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, period. Next verse. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been what? In your hearing. Amen? Now let's read what Isaiah actually said. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2 is what he was quoting there. Isaiah said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Sounds right. Sounds exactly what Jesus said. To bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Sounds right. Sounds about the same. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. All right. Here's where it changes. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus put a period there. What's right there? A comma. Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of God, of our God. And it continues. Isn't that interesting? What did Jesus leave out? The day of vengeance, right? But Jesus said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He removed the veil. Amen? And the vengeance. I was studying this dilemma this week, um, and some people are bold enough to say that Jesus misspoke. 
that Jesus read it wrong. Now, if you think Jesus made a mistake, you're getting into some dicey territory, amen? I don't think Jesus made any mistakes. I think he knew exactly what he was doing and was completely aware of what he was saying. Only Jesus has the authority to do that, amen? Right. To correct what a prophet actually said, amen? Or unveil what Isaiah might have meant, but went a little too far with it, amen? He made it clear for us. <clears throat> Some of the Old Testament writers, on the other hand, they had a glimpse of the full truth. I mean, 90% of this was accurate, you know, according to Jesus. But like, like Grandpa pointed out last week, God made several covenants and pacts with kings and leaders. They all fell short at the end of the glory of the Lord. They tried their best and did the best with what they were revealed. Amen? They were still human. Only Christ himself is perfect at the end of the day. Amen? Keep that in mind as you read scripture. If you would turn to John chapter 5, 39. Read a couple verses here. Jesus said, John 5, 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about who? Me. me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Christ is ultimately the word of God. Christ is the word of God. While I believe the Bible is true and it testifies about Jesus, Christ alone is the word of God. The word of God, we get confused on that word, word. <laughs> word in the actual uh, Hebrew, oh, I guess it would be Greek uh, language, logos, logos, the expression of what God has to say, amen? The Bible is the word of God in a secondary sense, points us to Jesus, but ultimately he's the word. John 1 clearly says this, in the beginning was the word, uh, was the word and the word was who? God. And then it goes on to say, the word was made flesh Jesus the scriptures and I thank God for them are God inspired and God breathed it's like Jamie Englehart pointed out last time he was here they were God breathed not God written the writers tell a story of Israel and their journey and their relationship with God sometimes they pleased God and other times they, if you read the Old Testament man they failed miserably amen some of the atrocities in the Old Testament in the name of God looked nothing like Jesus. Amen. The wars and the killing, mostly done because the Israelites said that God was behind them. And he was. But I think they misunderstood what God truly desired. Amen. God loved their adversaries just as much as he loved them. I don't, that doesn't sound right coming out of my mind, but I truly am starting to believe that. Amen? I'm not saying he approved of their adversaries' worship of idols or anything like that, but I struggle seeing Jesus command the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites and whatnot, an entire group of people. I just don't think Christ is in the midst of that. Christ unveils things to us, though. In Christ, uh, Christ is the, the fullness of God. Amen? Revealed in man. Christ never wants to see war over anything. Jesus is the prince of peace. Not war. He's not the God of war. <laughs> He's the God of peace. The prince of peace. I look at what's going on today with talks of war with China, Russia, World War III going on. That's not what God intended. It might, it might come to pass. It might be nuclear war and everything like that. That might very well happen. But, you know, just because you're on a certain side doing the fighting doesn't make it right. Amen? Right. Amen. That's hard to grasp sometimes, but it's true. We Americans are so hell-bent on putting our enemies under our feet, we should be pointing them to Jesus' feet. Amen? Amen. 
We should be humbling ourselves and praying for the, the enemy to repent. Wouldn't that be a sight? If revival and prayer unleashed across the nations instead of war, war is an ancient thing, you know. It's going on and on and on. How about we stop? The buck stops with this generation, amen. Let's, start, let's stop, you know, um, loading up the guns and the, uh, the tanks and everything like that. Let's have grace and peace on our patches. Unpopular opinion, I know. Believe me. Carl and I kind of have our debates and whatever. <laughs> but I believe that to be the truth. That veil, I believe, was released, you know, unveiled on my eyes. <laughs> it took me some years to come to that conclusion. I served in the Navy. <laughs> I mean, I'm surrounded by, I'm a police officer for crying out loud. You know, like, that doesn't sound right. Forgiving our enemies is so much harder to do than to say. So let the veil be lifted in your own life, church. Let it be lifted. Let Christ be revealed in your life. Here's what I really want to get across to you all today. Christ not only unveils Scripture to us through the Holy Spirit, He unveils our true lives within us, the Christ within us. You see, we all have a past, right? But we also have a future. You, you know, some of us have a really rough B.C. story, I like to call it, before Christ. <laughs> Jeremy, I'm looking at you. <laughs> oh, he admits it. <laughs> I'm the same way, man. Uh, but some of us are God's first cousin and never sinned a day, a day in our lives, right? <laughs> so, I mean, but no. At the end of the day, truth is we all go from being dead in sin to alive in Christ. When we finally did what, when we finally realized what he did for us. Amen. You too have a part two. <laughs> Just like scripture has a part two, if you want to call it that, a light at the end of it. You do as well. God unveils what your purpose is on this earth. He unveils what you're here to do in your, uh, through your dreams or your goals or your aspirations. <laughs> When you finally give him the right place in your, in your life. Bill Clevenger, a lot of you remember him. He was an elder in our church. Moved down to Arizona. He always sends me these little cute little jokes and quotes or whatever. But he said to me last week, he said, If God is your co-pilot, then change seats. <laughs> I thought that was clever. Let him take over the controls. We always say God is in control. God is in control. But yet we're a control freak, you know. How about we start practicing what we preach? Let him take the reins. Let his life guide our lives. Amen? Not the other way around. You, you be his helper. Maybe what you're facing today is a personal battle. Like a struggle with attitude. It's time to assume the mind of Christ. Amen? Have grace on our tongues. Maybe it's a generational problem you're facing. Your mother and your father, they couldn't deal with it, so now here we are. You're dealing with the same issues that your great, great grandparents faced. Alcoholism, drug addiction. I mean, it could be anything, racism. That gets passed down when it's not dealt with. We need to deal with this stuff, amen? Ask yourself, has Christ truly unveiled himself? in every aspect of my life for the world to see. I'm sure there's a lot of areas in my own heart that I still got to let Christ unveil himself and reveal himself, right? Correct me. Correct me. Correct my doctrine. Correct, you know, my belief system, how I see the world. Pray for eyes to see the world how he sees the world. Amen? Because oftentimes we're not right on the money, right? <laughs> That's just being humble. Take inventory on your belief system and the beliefs you hold true. Beliefs you've been passed down from generation to generation, what your dad and what your mom has taught you, what your grandparents have spoken in your life. Ask Christ how he feels about those. If it doesn't look like Christ, I've got good news. 
there's something you can do about it. There's a better way to live through repentance. Change your ways, change your mind, change your outlook on the world, amen? It's just a mind game, that's all. Christ just unveils things and it changes our mind, right? And we got to walk in that, that light. You can enter a new understanding that God loves you. He does. He loves you, Austin. He loves you. You are his son. Emmy, you are his daughter. Amen? Believe it. God wants what's best for you. He has so much more than what we've been settling for. All you have to do is yield yourself to him. Just lay it at his feet, whatever it is you're struggling with. Maybe it's anxiety, depression, unhealthy thoughts, thoughts of self-harm. Come forth to the altar as we sing this song. If you feel like you need prayer, maybe you want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, allow Christ to reveal himself completely in your life. Thank you.
congregation, the hungry you, congregation, Jesus. the thirsty congregation after your life, after yes. your mind, after your righteousness, Lord, in Jesus' Thank name. Thank you, Lord. Let your peace fall on this congregation and those who are watching from afar be surrounded by your mighty angels and protection. In Jesus' name, let, let this house be covered in the hedge of protection, Lord, in yes, Jesus' Lord. name. In Jesus' name. I thank you for what you're doing in this ministry, in this house. Lord, thank you for those who are sowing into this ministry in Jesus' name so we can build the kingdom in Jesus' name, Lord, so we can see this yes. kingdom grow, so we can see lives touched, not just here in Peculiar, Missouri, but all across this region and eventually across the world in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. you guys have a wonderful, wonderful week. Well, I guess Carla has something. <laughs> And to just come up like that. So Austin, really quickly. Um, so what I heard in the spirit as we were singing this song, You Will Be With Me in Paradise, as that song came up, your name came up in my spirit. And the Lord, I don't know if you know that part of the scripture in there where it talks about the two thieves that were hung on the cross with Jesus, right? And one of them is like, if you're Jesus, get us down from here. If you're really that powerful, get us down. And the other was like, don't you recognize who this is? And the Lord responded to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. They didn't do anything, didn't say anything. There was no, no other m notion it, except for acknowledging who he was. And the Lord's been waiting for you to come home for a long time. There's nothing left for you to do your home. This is what he's always wanted for you. There's no other step you have to make. There's no song you have to sing. You just have to be ready to come home in your home now. So that's what I had in my spirit for you. Amen. 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 God. Very good. Thank you. Give Very Austin good. a good hand. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. All right. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day. Don't forget, ladies, next Saturday is a wonderful day. Linda said, my Linda said, Linda Buckner does such a wonderful job. We laugh. We have fun. We play games. We do this. Then we have a speaker. So be here for that next Saturday at 10 o'clock.